This is the Sailing Catamaran Blue, a 2004 Robertson Kane 47-foot Leopard. This boat is 24 and a half feet wide, has a four-foot draft, and a nominal sailing speed of nine and a half knots, or it can make nine knots when just motoring. This boat can comfortably sleep eight people in four private staterooms, each with their own full shower and toilet. The boat has a full galley, indoor dining room, and very spacious outdoor seating and lounge area. Blue is privately owned and primarily used for charters by George Steele, an Antiguan local who circumnavigated sailed around the world and is a bit of a legend in the blue water spearfishing community. Be sure to stay tuned after the full boat tour to see how this boat sails when we take her out for a beautiful sunset. Then I sit down for an exclusive interview with George and his first mate, Hannah, where we discuss their interesting backgrounds and their future plans. Then finally, I'll go over my personal score for this capable cruising catamaran. Let's dive on in. Good morning, good morning. All right. Good morning. It is a beautiful day here. My boat is anchored just up in front of us. We've got a nice big beach right up here. It is just another perfect day here in Antigua. So we're gonna start out from the very bow here and work our way to the stern. Then we're gonna go in through the cockpit, helm station, and then inside some of the guest cabins. So first out, starting out up on the bow here, we've got the trampolines. This is what makes catamarans so cool. It's the fact that you can just ugh, always take a break, always relax right up here in the front. And when you're sailing, it's a pretty magical experience like our sail last night. We've even got a seat up here, a little place to hang out, another seat over there. It does feel pretty exposed up here, but you have so many things to grab onto while we were sailing and the boat was going up and down. I had no fear, like nobody was gonna go overboard. We've got the furler for the jib that runs up here. It's nice and out of the way. Cheek block brings it up and over. There's just a ton of room up here. This is the big draw of catamarans and honestly, some of the monoholes just don't have as much as I love my own sailboat. But having all this space up here to relax and enjoy yourself, get everybody together, it's really great. All right, checking out the anchor here. I was just talking with George. He has a 70 pound Saka XL anchor with 120 feet of chain and 3 8 inch chain diameter. But that all comes up right under here. Um, that then comes through here. We've also got space for the bumpers and a whole lot of stuff back in there. You see that chain goes all the way back here. Um, and there we go, to a big beefy windlass. This is what's gonna keep you in place if you do end up going on an overnight charter or just for George in general while he's staying here next to my boat right there. This is what keeps you all in place here. And it's good, the better your anchor, the better places you can go with it and comfortably sleep and know that you're not gonna go anywhere. And here we've got the other water tank as well as, look at that, just a ton of space for storage in here. Storage space on a boat is always at a premium, so the more you've got, the better. Having it up here, this is sort of a somewhat dry locker. I'm sure if the right wave does come up, you could get things wet in here. But everything looks like it's meant to get wet. Got all of our anchor chain, look at all that. The road going all down in there. We have a spare fortress anchor down there. We've got bumpers, as well as then extra diesel and gasoline, it looks like. So plenty of space to store everything. We've got one of the hatches for one of the forward staterooms and the other hatch for the other forward stateroom. Now these are nice because they're gonna scoop in air. It's gonna put a nice fresh breeze over you. I mean, it's only like 8.30 right now in the morning, but already you can see I'm trying to bundle up just to get the sun off of me because it gets hot quick here. Beautiful thing about the Caribbean though is you've always got a nice breeze coming out of the east. So if you're down below and you're not in the sun, you're on your bed, it's gonna be just a beautiful morning for you. Working our way up a little bit more with something that's I think really unique, especially about the leopard catamarans. You have these steps here. Now these are the windows that go back into the salon. And the way the steps are here is really good just so you can walk up, but also they're gonna block out the direct sun as the sun gets higher and hotter throughout the day. So we're able to just take these, walk right up. We have all this non-skid going all the way up here. Even the bimini I can come and walk up on. George has two solar panels. These are 180 watts each. Got the stack pack here for the massive mainsail. One thing I'll say about the mainsail I was very impressed with last night was how easily it went up the tracks. And George said, you know, it's, it's maintenance is the reason for that. I think another reason though, is the slides that he's got on here. This sort of a track I think is much more effective than honestly the ones I have on my boat that go inside the mast a bit more. There's a lot more friction there. Whereas every one of these has, uh, has bearings and wheels on it. So watching it go up, and I mean this really, this is one of the biggest mainsails I've ever seen, especially per size of the boat. 
went up very easily. We've also got our main sheet that goes all through here and goes down as well as your traveler. All those controls are gonna be all the way down there in the salon. Really like that because it keeps it well out of way so you don't have to come forward at all. I'm looking at the boat here and there's not much you would have to come forward for. I assume probably putting a reef in the main you'd have to come forward for. But other than that, so much of it's gonna be done back there. They do raise the mainsail from this winch right here. So obviously when you go to start out, you're gonna be putting your mainsail up here. I feel very secure up here though with a lot of, I mean, great handholds all around that you can grab onto. Coming up on the starboard side of the boat, we've got where the captain's helm would be. And you've got a nice big window right here. This window is nice so you can look up at the sail while you're sailing. You can see your windex if you don't, if your wind instrument isn't working. Uh, I just, I always like being able to see up. I've got a little window on my boat proportional to the size, but this one obviously is quite a bit bigger. So I'm up on top of the Bimini right now, right next to the window here. And again, what's really cool is I'm in the shade of the huge stack pack. So I'm able just to lounge and I'm not, you know, getting blasted by the sun. So it's kind of cool little places you could find on here to lay out and relax, put a towel out here. Or if you did want to get sun, you could put a towel out. <laughs> There's like a million places that you could be here. You'd be so comfortable, including right here, including right there, including up there. Boats like this are really meant to have a lot of people on them. They're meant to cater to so much space for everyone. And lastly, just looking at the mast here, we've got a winch on either side. Now these are non-powered winches, but as you see from the footage from yesterday, these winches can be powered winches when he plugs in the electric tool. I think that's a pretty cool combination to have, and it's obviously gonna save you a lot of time, really specifically when you're just trying to raise up the mainsail. So you've got 200 gallons of fresh water. There's plenty for showers, everything else, but as well, they have a water maker on board, which I believe makes about 20 gallons per hour, if not maybe a little bit more, because you have so much space for a bigger water maker on this boat. But it's good to know that you're gonna have fresh water and water that comes out of a water maker is so much purer than any other sort of tap water, city water, even well water. It's, it's purer than rain water. So you know it's good. Working our way back along the boat here, uh, I almost missed this, but he's actually got these nice big side shades here. Now, if you were in, say, a colder environment or one where you weren't getting as much sunlight, I'm sure these would stay off. But here in the Caribbean, there's just so much sun. You want to make sure you're getting as little heat inside as possible, as well as it's kind of nice to be inside where it's not so bright. That's why I have to be wearing sunglasses right now. It's bright out. So this is nice just to keep everything nice and uh, nice and cool inside. You've got your shrouds here, and this is the only thing you sort of have to move around. I like that they have these protectors on them just some sort of a plastic coating that goes over it. You can see what the actual cable looks like here. I really like these as well. If your sail ever rubs up against them, it's much less likely they're gonna fray. I like to just grab onto them, swing around them, but you really don't have to move very much. Now as we move back here, we see our port side jib sheet winch. And then on the other side is gonna be a starboard side jib sheet winch. Those obviously are getting used quite a bit uh, whenever you're gonna be tacking or we're gonna be bringing in the jib. And the jib does come back you know, a pretty good ways as you can see from yesterday. All right, something I was just learning more from George is that you've got your jib sheet here, but then you also have your main sheet here. You see the way it comes back and through there, so you can use either of these with these jam cleats. So you can be pretty clever about it. And to be honest, when you're sailing, what you're gonna be bringing in and letting out the most is your jib sheet and your main sheet. So you can use either of them on one or one on each, depending on how you're sailing and how you wanna do it. Again, it's nice that you've got little places to hang on to as you go to move forward. You know, this boat is incredibly stable, but you still wanna have something to hold on to while you're moving uh, aft and forward on the boat. As we come back into here though, we've got the full cockpit and you've got so much space here for really whatever you wanna do. I mean, you could probably seat something like 12 people just back here, have a nice big buffet dinner style, go on, it's all very nice. We take a look at that cabin in a little bit, but it's another one of the cabins that's got a hatch that comes back. You're not gonna get as much airflow through here, but it will be, I would say, a little bit more stable because boats tend to move a bit more in the front than they do in the back, especially while they're sailing. As we continue on here at the back, again, good handholds. Coming back here, you've got access here for the engines. You've got access way back there for the engines. Now, I helped out some friends one time. Uh, they were also on a Leopard, and it's kind of interesting that when you want to get in and work on these, you actually end up moving the helm over or back. And that's going to move this out of your way because this goes right down to your rudders. But you want to move them out of your way while you go in there. Again, look at how much space he's got in there. That is just incredible. Let's take a quick look at the engine. Before I head down there, I just want to say this very important thing. This 
will save your life. You ready for this? Let's see where it goes to. Because if you forget that, you will get knocked on the noggin and it will hurt. <laughs> now this isn't something that anyone who's chartering on board would ever be going into, but I think it's cool to take a look at the nuts and bolts and how the boat works. As well as I think storage is just such an essential thing on a boat. You really gotta have a lot of it. It's actually kind of cool. Right here we've got extra hose line that goes right up there to where you would be able to take a shower right off the back. You go swimming on the beach, you come back in, you literally just climb right up onto the back of the boat and you shower off with that right there. Like I said, we have the steering quadrant right here. This is gonna be hooked up together, so they both operate exactly the same. He could have and would have been tuning these when he first put this on, tightening those bolts, so that way the rudders were lined up, and now whenever he turns the helm one way or the other, uh, yeah, he's gonna do it that way. I'm gonna take a guess here. Oh, maybe not. Huh. I'm gonna take a guess that this probably prevents maybe oversteering, so that way you can't go too far. This is Spectra that's been spliced on a shackle like that. It's gonna have a crazy amount of strength to it, so that way it can't go too far. And I'd imagine that's what it's for, so that way it can never go too far back this way. It's kind of a cool way to do it. I guess both sides are gonna be blocked off that way. Huh, that's interesting. It's always cool seeing how boats accomplish things. So back here I have the 4JH Yanmar 56 horsepower engine. He's got two of these, so if my math is correct, it's 112 horsepower that he's got. Now, as you can see from the footage yesterday, he was able to back right up to my dinghy, and that's pretty neat. Got your starter battery back here. You've got some fuel filters. Oil filters, I see the double rancors over there. Those look really good, actually. Yeah, pretty nice. Again, something that's really great about uh, catamarans over monohulls is you have two engines, which A, you can steer the boat, back the boat up, and spin on your own axis, which is really cool. One of the downsides, though, is you have two engines. That means twice the amount of maintenance you have to do. And I'm sure if you talk to anybody who owns a catamaran, they'll tell you some unique problems that come up when you have two different engines breaking things at different times and being repaired at different times. I'm sure that can be its own whole ball of wax. All right, one last thing I'm noticing that I really think is interesting is that, that white hatch cover right here. Ooh. That would go up, because right up above us here is the aft cabin we're gonna be checking out in a minute, the aft stateroom. And what I think is pretty cool about that is I have no doubt there's a ton of insulation, ton of foam, so you'd never really know it. Uh, that the engine had been on recently, so you're not getting hot in your bed, anything like that. I have no doubt that it's good for that. But what I'm imagining happens right there is you take away a couple panels and some insulation, you can pop that, and then you can have somebody up above you handing you things, or you could be handing things up to them. And I'm just imagining the repair process. You know, this this is a pretty roomy engine room, if I'm being honest. Like, I, I've got quite a bit of space to move around, but any engine room, including this one, is still a bit cramped. So having somebody that can hand you things down would only speed up your repairs and make them so much easier. Maybe they'll hand you down a drink, a little lemonade to cool off. And this is what I meant about the shower. <laughs> Look at that, nice and easy, able to shower off back here. This is good as well for the boat owner, for the captain. That way nobody's dripping salt water inside or especially the worst, sand. No sand allowed on boats, folks. You've got a ladder that comes down here and then on the opposite one you have no ladder. If you're a little bit more athletically inclined and you're able to do a little bit of a muscle up, you can get yourself up onto the back pretty easily. If not, you grab the ladder, pull it into the water and you'll be able to just walk right up on that. Also back here that's very much so worth noting is the dinghy. Now right now the dinghy isn't up as high as it could go. These can still go quite a bit higher, but I believe this is about as high as he normally takes it because it really doesn't need to go any higher. It does make coming in through here, you know, just a quick duck, but that's really nothing bad. But when you want to go on excursions, when you want to go to the beach, when you want to go do anything else, drop the dinghy down, send it right over there, and you're good to go. We've got a 9.8 Nissan Marine uh, outboard engine there. It looks like it's two-stroke and you're probably not gonna be able to plane with maybe three people or maybe even two. But with one person, you should be able to plane in this thing. And again, it's good just to be able to get around, go into town, go do something, or bring everybody to the beach for a picnic. So before I start going into the cockpit here, which is a lot to talk about on it, I wanna check this out. This is a beautiful Starlink unit. This means you're gonna have satellite internet wherever you are, it does not matter, and it's gonna be high-speed internet at that. This is super cool to have in a boat. It's one of the only things I don't have on my boat that I really wish I did have. But certainly if you're coming to a boat like this, you know, in the Caribbean, you wanna know that you're gonna have internet, 
This is just gonna be Wi-Fi here on the boat, ready to go, super fast. That's it, you're connected to everybody. You need to do work emails. You need to catch up with your friends. You gotta check your Instagram, whatever. You have internet, awesome. All right, that concludes the outside of the boat. Now we're gonna start working our way in. First thing here, into the cockpit. Cockpit area on a catamaran is much different than a monohull. First off, you got the helm station just right over here. Anybody can quickly go to it. The big wraparound table. People can even sleep out here. You've got a ton of storage pretty much everywhere. Looks like we've got the propane locker right here. We got this one. Just more random storage. I can't stress it enough. Just having storage places to put things is so essential. And sometimes you need to have storage that's a little bit more outside. And obviously once you're inside, you need to have storage in there as well. But having this is just such a key. Got all your tools right here. I like that he puts tools here. It's a place that's nice and easy access to. I think that's really important. Now there's one tool that I really want to check out that I'm not seeing. Hey George, can we see that, that power winch? This is actually smart. Electric tools inside, so they're getting a little bit less salt air. Look so, at this. Basically, <laughs> it's a Milwaukee heavy duty drill. And you go on eBay, you pay for, they're available, they pay for the winch attachment. So you just change out the chuck and you have yourself a very affordable power winch tool. That's so, so cool. It turns every winch on the boat into a powered winch for That's a cool. fraction of the price. <laughs> and what we saw yesterday with how long it took to get the mains, because the main is massive, it needs to go quite a ways. So putting it on there just made a huge difference for bringing it up. Now, I feel like yesterday it was on the slow, it was uh, rotating for a slow way to go up. Could it have been popped for the other way to have it go faster? Because I assume it was a two-way winch, or two-speed winch, I should say. Yeah, you can put it in reverse and get the other gear going. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That's so cool. I love that, that he's got that on here. And again, keeping electrical tools inside, non-powered tools outside, I think that works great. So continuing on in here, like I said, you end up doing so much of your living out here. He does have snaps up here if he wants to put down side shades, but I think what's cool about being outside like this is you're sort of out in nature, but you're, you're dry, you're under shade. But I mean, just look at your view. This is really the whole reason why people want to be on boats, is they want to have a view like this. They want to be able to jump off the back, go to the beach, go walk around, be under some palm trees over there, and then pick up anchor and go to the next spot. And that's what this does. This is what's so cool about this. Uh, under here, I know we've got a bunch of fins and stuff. Now, I'm gonna talk about it more later, but George is a bit of a legend in the spearfishing community, particularly his place here in Antigua in the blue water. And we're gonna have to give him a section on there to, to talk about it. But I myself have spearfished all around the world. I've held the world record before. Like, I know quite a bit about spearfishing. I'm very humbled to be able to learn from George about blue water spearfishing, particularly with Wahoo. He's kind of the man here in the Caribbean. So again, we'll talk more about that with him in a little bit here. Continuing on though, we're gonna check out the helm station. Now, George is gonna be at the helm most of the time if you end up on board Blue here. He's been on this boat for, I believe, a bit under a year now, um, but he has been sailing boats and delivering boats for, I'm not sure, I mean, I wanna just say most of his life. I know he's effectively done a circumnavigation, and again, we'll, we'll interview him, and we'll get more details on that later. Your forward and your reverse for your port and your starboard engine, putting these, you know, one forward, one back, that's gonna quickly turn the boat on an angle. And as you guys can see from yesterday, he was able to back right up to my dinghy. You know, if I had a, if we had to do what we did yesterday with my mono hull, it would be a very different experience. It would be a very, you know, we shoot, maybe we overshoot, okay, we reset, go again, go again, go again. With a catamaran, you can just back right up and you just know you're gonna get it. So that's really cool. We've got our wind speed and wind direction, our depth sounder, our chart plotter, Good old compass heading right here. And then all the other gauges we need per each engine. So we've got RPMs, engine temperature, hour meter, keys for both of them, they're independent on there. And then obviously you've got the helm right here. Now the helm station itself, very, very comfortable. But you know what, when you're doing especially any sort of longer sail, you're gonna be popping the autopilot on and everybody kind of just relaxes until you need to do attack. You know, then maybe you get things together. Right over here, you've got one of the jib and main sheet winches. Now, because of these jam cleats right here, you can winch one on and then remove it from the winch and then put the other one on and pull it tight. And then when you want to let one off, 
you can wrap it around a couple times, pop it open, and then let your line out. So it is cool that if you want to, you could do everything from right here with just that one winch. But having the one over there makes things, I think, a little bit easier, a little bit quicker. Your other controls, though, are just over my shoulder right here. The way Leopard did this whole bimini structure, I really, really like. It gives you a lot of places to run lines through, as you can see with the pulleys that come through. We've got a winch right here. I like this. Boom, boom, boom. That goes right here to our dinghy davit system. Now, like on my boat and like many, you kind of just heave the thing up and you've got some blocks that give you mechanical advantage, but being able to put it onto a winch like that and just crank it in, it really helps as well because this one is hinged both sides here. The load that's actually on the lines and then the winches is greatly reduced and the angle that it picks up the dinghy from keeps it away from the boat. I really like this. This is another really big plus side that catamarans can do that mono holes, I mean, we could do it, but you never see it. You know, it's just, it wouldn't quite work the same as just having a hard bar up ahead. So pretty cool that he's got this here. As well back here, you're gonna have your traveler. And I believe this is just your two travelers coming right through here. We've got the furling line right here so we can furl it back in. So this winch is gonna get quite a bit of use versus you see that side, there's nothing over there. This is really good, really intelligent design though. You know, you've got the, the helm station, you have more of kind of the work side of the boat right here. And then you've got like sort of the couch and the table over here for a bit more relaxation on this side. Also worth mentioning are these two trolling rods. Now these are gonna be great when you're going from one tropical beach to another tropical beach. On your way there, you might as well put some lines out, catch a mahi, catch a wahoo, who knows what you're gonna get, but it's a lot of fun while you're on here to build a fish. You've got rod holders there on the sides, and then you end up fighting the fish from right down here. And yeah, it's pretty great to be able to have fresh fish, you know, in between beach to beach. All right, now that we've seen the outside of the boat, let's start working our way inside here. The salon, navigation station, and the galley. Uh, I'm gonna start out with the salon here. Cause again, if it's raining or if it's early in the morning maybe, or late at night, you'll spend quite a bit of time in here. You can see, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say you can see seven or eight people inside the booth and a couple right here, but it depends on how much you like your friends. Um, yeah, there's not really too much to say on that. You've got a lot of food storage that's gonna be underneath these. Being a sailboat, everything has to have sort of a second purpose to it, another function, and storage is always at a premium, so you're gonna be having a lot of food stored back in here. He does have air conditioning on the boat, which I think is pretty cool to mention that, I mean, if you're not used to the tropics and you come down here, you're gonna be broiling. So having that, especially in your bedrooms, is a huge, huge thing. Um, remember how bright it was outside? It's only gotten brighter, but you can see I've got no sunglasses on now, no hat and it's a very nice, comfortable lighting in here. I feel like on my mono hull, a lot of times it gets very dark because I'm down a bit further. I don't have as many sources of light, but on here, I really like how there's a lot of sources to sort of diffuse the light. You've got the sun shades here on the sides, and I can only imagine if you took those off how bright it would be in here, and maybe you'd want that, so it's cool to have that option. These are the tinted windows you can see here, and then you do have the option to open these up so you uh, can bring some air in through here, as well as you've got the little hatches here. And these are pretty cool. They've actually got a little bar over them, so no line can get caught on them. And that would actually be a sort of a disaster if you were on maybe a major passage or something, and one of these got ripped off and the seas are coming up. So protecting your hatches is highly important. It's cool that Leopard thought ahead for that design. Here in the galley, we've got uh, like this too. You can cut directly on this if you want to. Although, George, do you ever cut directly on it or do you use a cutting board? I use a cutting board. Ah, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. Uh, <laughs> so you got a cutting board here. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a simple galley. There's not really too much to it. A big thing people like about catamarans, whether you own one or whether you're on a charter on one, is they call it galley up. On a mono hull, obviously you have to go down away from the, the cockpit area where you want to be sitting, where you want to be enjoying yourself. You have to go down into the boat to get to the galley. But on a catamaran, you know, you're just walking through a door or if you're right here, you're already inside. So within here, we've got a three burner stove um, and this does not gimbal because we're on a catamaran and I'm a little bit jealous of catamarans not needing to gimbal like that. An ice machine, that's how you know your luxury. A microwave, that's how you definitely know your luxury. We got fresh water coming out of here, and there is, there's no salt water pump on the boat, but when you have a water maker, you don't really need that as much. And if you really have to, if you really have a dirty dish, or say a dirty pan that maybe has a bunch of gunk stuck on it, you'll just go to the back there on the swim platform and you'll just wash it, maybe scrub it in the ocean, and you're good to go. Then wash off with fresh water, no rust, no problem. 
Again, we've got our drink choices here, plenty of them. Uh, you know, this is actually worth mentioning. So I, I don't drink, so I'm not actually interested in the alcohol. What I am interested in is how it's just sitting right here. I could never do this on a monohull, never. I mean, it had to be a really, really big monohull. And even then, once you go sailing, it would have to be put away. But as we were sailing yesterday and everything, I mean, this is right where they are. And it gives me partial anxiety to see a glass bottle just standing up like this, not, you know, not supported by anything. But again, that's the beauty of a catamaran that's 47 feet long and 24 and a half feet wide. That's just gonna give you some huge stability there. All right, not too much else to say down here. You also do have an oven on this. Fresh water, a lot of times I'm just gonna use uh, one of these big jugs here, just so people know where the water is. Coming over here, we've got the main freezer. Oof, look at that. That is plenty of space in there. Now, you'll see this a lot on boats where the fridge or the freezer is down and in something. The reason for that's simple. When you open up a fridge, it just dumps all the cold air out. But when you're on land, you're plugged into the grid, no problem, there's always more electricity to repower the fridge to get that cold air back to get that cold air back. But on a boat, mm -mm, everything has to be very, very efficient. So we always have our, our refrigerators and our freezers down and in there, so that way all the cold air stays down and in there. Now this also makes for really good countertop space, although obviously if you wanna get in here, you have to move it. I wish you guys could tell the weight on this thing and the insulation is incredible, but I'll stop messing with that. Over here then, we've got our fridge. It goes back in pretty well. Look at that, look at the ice back there. Yeah, it's keeping everything nice and cold. Now this one is, side opening so we did just dump some of the cold out there the upside though to a side opening fridge is you have much better access to everything when you have to go down for things uh like on my boat and on most boats you end up kind of not being able to get to a lot of things or you can forget about stuff easier when it's side on like so something really cool I was just learning from george is that the fridge is 12 volt run which i assumed they kind of all were so the solar panels take care of this there's just no worrying about it gotta love solar the freezer, however, is unique. The freezer is engine compression driven. Did I get that right? Compressor driven. Engine compressor driven, meaning the engine runs the compressor when it is turned on. So he has to run the engine to run this, to compress the, I'm gonna call it R-134A because that's what I'm used to dealing with for my own fridge freezer. And once it does that, then it sort of saves up that compressed gas or that compressed liquid that then keeps the freezer frozen. That is cool. Now, upsides and downsides to both. Um, the fridge running on 12 volt means it's a little bit less efficient, but it's always gonna work, it's always gonna be on, it's reliable, I like that. The upside of the compressor driven, en engine compressor driven for the freezer is it's extremely efficient. There's so much energy being spun around on a 58 horsepower engine like down there that it's gonna effortlessly power the freezer here. So I think both those are really cool. But moving on, we've got more storage, we've got bookshelves, we've got everything else we could possibly need in here. Coming over this way, like I said, you've got storage, you have places, ooh, that's comfortable. Were these, were these redone recently? No. These can't be original. Um, I don't believe they're original, but the boat is a 2004. So, yeah. You know, but it's it's been around for a while. They last pretty good. I mean, they're, yeah. they're, they're pretty sturdy. Because, oh, they're inside too. Anyway, so these are extremely comfortable. You know, it's nice to be in here or out there in the morning or the evening, have your coffee, whatever. I personally feel that, especially most people who don't live on a boat, when you come out to one, you want to be outside. As long as the weather allows it, you'll be out there. Moving on over. This would be your navigation station. You might have a little chair that comes under here. Now, times have changed, you know, in the last 20, especially 30 years, 20 years really. Um, now we just use GPS. I mean, to be honest, my cell phone is what I use to do all my navigation. So you don't need a place for paper charts and everything else, but this then becomes a place for your switchboards. We have our 12 volt DC panel right here. We have our 110 volt AC power systems right here. We've got Northern Lights. I'm gonna assume that's gonna be a generator right here. VHF inside here as well, there's one out there. And then I almost missed it, but we've also got a huge TV here. So that's really cool that you could do dinner, and it swivels and everything. So you could do dinner and just sit right here, watch a movie. That's really nice. I like that for the entertainment value of it. Again, we've got some space for stuff up in there. Storage space, I'm just gonna sound like a broken record, but it's, it's pivotal on a boat. So now we're gonna take a walk down below. Now, both sides of the boat are even. Both sides are mirrored one of the other. So we're gonna come on down here and you can see how the hallway sort of works to either side. I like that it's still really open here because there's no sense in just closing it off. 
so it makes the boat feel very big, very roomy. As we look down here, this is the entrance into the aft stateroom. Ooh, hoo, hoo, hoo. wow. George, you did a great job with like the nautical theme in here. I love it. And I'll be honest, like this right here reminds me a bit of my boat with the, the blue and the white. So I'm a little bit, little bit biased here. All right, where do I start? Where do I start? Well, first off, you have a very big, uh, this looks like to be a queen size bed to me. Yes. Um, as well, you're gonna have the hatch directly above, but if you want to, you can pull a little sunshade over so you don't get all the sun in your face, but you'll still get some air that way. Something else I forgot to mention that's really cool. Imagine this, you, you've sailed out to Barbuda and you're at anchor and it's stable as can be, just a little slight rock, you know, to lull you to sleep. But while you're laying in bed, you look up and you can see the stars. Now that is a pretty priceless experience. To be able to look up and see the stars while you're trying to sleep. I mean, that's pretty cool. Also, beyond that, I really like how we've got a window going back and a window to the side. So you can see in so many different directions here as well. And this is the other really cool part about this boat. You can just stick your head up and you can just look and you can climb up out of here if you want. And you're outside. So you've got two very accessible ways in and out of your room. Maybe you forget something, maybe you want somebody to hand you something down, maybe a drink, who knows. Um, you're right here when you wake up or next to your friends. This is kind of encouraging my childlike sense of wonder right now. Ooh, let's take a, take a moment on the bed here. So I've got a lot of, a lot of space here. Look at that. Now I'm six foot, so I'm spread out as much as I can be. So this is very comfortable for two people. Because you are sideways to the boat, the boat might do a little bit of this at anchor. You're really not gonna feel it, and you're certainly not gonna feel it sideways. So this is a very stable bed, which honestly on my monohull, I, I kind of move around a lot. I get, I get rocked, and sometimes I don't like it. Sometimes it's a little bit too much, but it's never gonna be a lot on this boat. It would have to be a vicious storm to actually feel the heel and the rock on this boat. So. That is awesome though. I mean, look at that. From, from the bed right here, I can see the beach going back. That's, that's pretty great. You've got some fans. As well, I notice he also keeps a dehumidifier here. A dehumidifier is gonna take the humidity down and that's just gonna make you feel so much more comfortable at night. We've got some 12 volt USB charging for your cell phones right here. You can put a whole bunch of your luggage, whatever you brought with you right there. And you know what's kind of funny is the first thing I think I actually noticed when I came into the room was was this was this uh, this lamp? I don't know why. <laughs> I'm not much of an interior decorator kind of guy, but that is a pretty cool lamp, I gotta say. We do have one more hatch over here, so we can look out across. We just pop these two down like that. Swivels and stays open. Oh, I mean, I can feel the breeze from this. Yeah, that is so cool to be able to look out directly over the water while you're still in your room. So, like I said, we've got four ways. We have one, two, three, and then four ways in the room to look out. As we move back further to the, the head here, the full in-suite head, you have one right here, and then you've also got this one here. Now, I really like though that it has the vision curtains. The vision curtains are nice, so in case you want some privacy, you put that one there, and now nobody can see into your room. You're completely, completely isolated. You have all the privacy that you could want. That's obviously important, especially when you're here in the bathroom, but I'm gonna pop this hatch and just feel yeah, that, that sucks in a whole lot more air here. We've got a full toilet right here. So I just talked with Jordan a little bit more and you guys might laugh at this, but just, just hear me out. This is the most impressive boat toilet I've ever seen. Now it's not one of those Japanese bidet ones, okay? So curb your, curb your enthusiasm. But here's what's cool about it. First off, you flush your toilet paper. And yes, on a lot of boats, you can't flush your toilet paper. You have to put that in a separate bin. Now on any boat, you only put human waste and maybe toilet paper, nothing else. So I do want to set that. I do want to let you guys know that you never flush feminine products or anything else down the toilet. You will destroy the boat. But on this toilet, you can flush toilet paper, so that's good. It uses fresh water, not seawater. Now that is more use on the boat. That is more use from like the water maker. But seawater, when it mixes with urine, it forms this smell. Like it's it doesn't smell great. Fresh water, no smell. It's just good to go. The other thing that George just told me that I really like that I'm gonna see now for the first time with you is when you hit the flush button, normal flush, apparently it flushes it three times. Let's watch. One. 
Fills it back up. Two. Wow. Three. That's incredible. I've never seen any toilet do that anywhere. I mean, you really, you, you sit up and you just, you close that lid and you just hit that button and that's it, that's, that's it, you're, you're good to go. You don't even have to hit a little lever, you don't have to wait or watch for anything, you just, you know you're good. Yeah, I've gotten to that point in my life, folks, where I'm now impressed by a toilet. This is what adulting feels like. <laughs> anyway, we got a mirror in here so we can, oof, looks like I gotta shave, uh, do whatever we need to do to stay hygienic here on the boat. Now, this also comes out like it does for most boats, so this can also be your wet head. So you can take a private shower in here. And for this, it's gonna hook in. And for this, it's gonna hook in right here, so you can angle it however you want. And again, look at this, like, you're taking a shower while you're looking outside here. And, you know, because of the height of this, you've, you've got full privacy. Nobody would ever be able to look in or see in at you, so that is just outstanding. This is, and again, for boat standards, this is a very big, very luxurious head. You've got plenty of room. And so if you do shower in here, all the water is going to go into here, and then there's going to be a little sump pump that's going to just drain it out for you. All right, so I spent a little bit more time than I would normally in this one room because this is effectively the same as all the other cabins. You can see this one's even named. <laughs> so, you can, <laughs> so you can pick which cabin you want before you come here. This is really cool. This is this is really nice. This is really luxurious. Oh, I can only imagine when the air conditioner is, you know, blowing air over onto you in here. That's got to be. It's got to be pretty nice. It's got to be pretty nice. This is much more luxurious than I'm used to, but I could get used to it. I could get used to it. My friend George on his catamaran Blue is just about to come pick me up for a little sunset sail. All right, I really cannot afford to fall in the water right now with all my cameras on. So we're gonna see just how skilled of a captain George is to pick me up here in my little dinghy. Why, hello. Do you want me to take the rod too? Oh, no, you're good, you're good. Well, how smooth is that? It's almost like we know what we're doing. <laughs> George, thanks for having me on board. Good to have you. Welcome aboard, Blue. So George has a new crew member slash stewardess slash chef who's helping out the boat, Hannah here. And Hannah is learning all the ins and outs and George is being a great teacher and mentor to her. If you guys have seen my channel before, you know I talk a lot about finding a good mentor and Hannah's done just that. Now what she's gonna be working on here is jumping the main. So we got the main sail coming up here through this jam cleat and she's gonna get to jump it. Okay. While she's doing this, George is doing his best to keep the boat straight into the wind so there's as little resistance as possible on the mainsail. But like my boat, the lazy jacks here, or I guess for the stack pack, can catch the battens. So you gotta block those off so they can't get in the way. But I'm noticing how well his mainsail slides up. He's got this outer track right here. Well, nope. you have it double wrapped on the self table. Okay. So one more, no, take it off. One more rock on the drum. Without hooking the self-tailor. Yeah. Oh, One more there. Self self-tailor. Thank you. Into there. Oh, you're doing great. Oh, they got themselves a power winch. Alright, ready? Sort of cheating, but look at that thing go.
captain's order, I blow the winch. Here we go. Release. You could hold like a thousand pounds like this, but with not enough wraps or not enough tension, it'll once it starts once it starts to strip it, it's dangerous. Because look where like your feet are, and it could take everything else off. Again, this is why having a sailing mentor is so great, and she's getting great lessons this way. All right, flight number two. Now there's footage on here. Now if I crash it, it's the end of the world. Watch the sunset. Keep watching the sunset. That was a successful sale. Anyway, let's head back up and now I want to talk with George, the captain and the owner of the boat, over his sailing experience, why he got this boat, what his charters are like, and obviously pick his brain a little bit about spearfishing. Wait, 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 wait. Right, so stainless steel legend <laughs> of a winch handle. Also works for mutinies. <laughs> <laughs> the famous quote from any captain, the beatings will continue until morale improves. <laughs> Before we get to any interviewing, we gotta have breakfast. But for me, this is second breakfast. All right, so we are now here sitting down with George, the captain and owner of Blue, as well as Hannah, the... Stu, the guest services manager here on board Blue. And we're going to get a little bit of background on both of them. We're going to talk about George's sailing and spearfishing background, how they do charters, all that fun stuff. So starting right off, George, introduce yourself a little bit to the people. 
Hi, my name is George Steele. Um, been a captain all of my adult life. Um, sailing and the ocean is what I've known for generations. I was originally from Grenada, uh, which is an island in the Southern Caribbean, but Antigua has been my home in my heart um, since I first came here at about 13 years old. Um, and this is where I reside full time. And I have a charter business here now. Before I used to do spare fishing charters, uh, some of you in the spare fishing community would be familiar with me. Um, the Wahoo King. <laughs> uh, COVID kind of killed my spare fishing charter business and uh, a mate of mine had this Leopard um, 47 2004 model, uh, X Moorings Charter Fleet. One of the best, in my opinion, one of the best charter boats that were ever been designed. Um, not only is she comfortable, spacious, sails extremely well for a fiberglass uh, cruising catamaran. My friend, because of COVID and health, the boat sat down in Grenada for several years, um, being neglected, and he couldn't get back to it. So he made me an offer I couldn't refuse. <laughs> so I decided to change gears from spearfishing charters and fishing commercially to um, something that's been second nature to me my whole life, which is uh, the sailing industry and chartering. And when you say second nature, you have an extensive sailing background. So I knew about George um, through spearfishing. I had seen him, I mean, honestly, spearfishing and, and teaching uh, Riley from La Vagabond once upon a time, the two of them are close. And uh, Riley was able to spear some Wahoo with, uh, with George, which was very cool stories in and of itself. But then as I got to know George, I was like, oh, he's got an extensive sailing background and you, you've affected me. You've sailed around the world, haven't you? I have. I have. Um, I did my first transatlantic when I was 18 um, and I've never stopped sailing since. But I come from a sailing family um, I'm related to the Spronks. Those of you in catamarans who know anything about cats would know about Spronk cats. We are some of the innovators of all modern catamarans. Uh, Peter Spronk, my cousin, started building these catamarans in Grenada and then moved the business to St. Martin. And we had uh, the first boat in the Guinness Book of World Records to sustain 30 knots. Um, That's fast. So I, I just grew up sailing. My dad had yachts. Um, I just, all my life, it's generational. My dad was a fisherman and a sailor. And uh, so is all my family and just grew up doing it. So it's all I know and still all I know and yeah. all I do. How, um, when you went around the world, has it just been once or has it been bits and pieces? It's been bits and pieces. As a professional sailor, you very rarely get one long yeah. circumnavigation. Um, it's not, this is my first time owning a sailboat, actually. Really? I always thought it was a pretty stupid idea to buy yourself a sailboat yeah those of us wrong. who now own sailboats like i can really understand just how silly that whole idea is <laughs> um it is non-stop it is worrying i mean it's wonderful yeah. there are a lot of pluses but they, a, a lot of people don't talk about the downside to it and it is never ending as you take one step forward you take three back every day and it's non-stop. And I used to get paid to sail other people's boats, so why would I own my own, right? You, were, mean, you were a smart man, you were. But now I'm a boat owner um, and I'm, I'm really enjoying the freedom. Um, but like you were saying, with, so I would get jobs, you do legs, you do, yeah. you know, or seasons or um, sometimes. What's the longest leg you did? Um, that'd be the Pacific. Yeah. Yeah. From, from where to where, um, what kind of boat were you on? It was a swan, and I went from Polynesia to Tonga. Ooh. And by the way, both absolutely dream spearfishing locations. Did you do any spearfishing when you were on I that? I did not. When I was what? sailing, um, all my spearfishing I did was when I was growing up in Grenada. Um, and we did it from very young. Uh, but once I started sailing, it, this is a good promo. Um, I was a heavy, I became a heavy smoker and my freediving was just 
shot. So uh, don't smoke, kids. Don't do it. <laughs> when I quit smoking, um, I started back free diving to get some elasticity back into my lungs, and I got back into it. And that's when I started blue water spearfishing, which I had never done before. And, and real quick. Spearfishing you can break up into two categories, reef spearfishing and blue water. Reef is, you can see the bottom and usually you're diving down to the reef. There's ground fish like snapper and grouper, things like that. Um, and that's mostly what I've done. I've done very little blue water spearfishing. That's why George has been such an instrumental teacher to me. Blue water spearfishing is you cannot see the bottom. You are just out in space, just blue deep water. You're hunting pelagic fish like wahoo, mahi-mahi, tuna, maybe marlin. And it's Sailfish. a completely different game. It's completely different. So, yeah. So, um, I spent the first year trying to figure out uh, blue water spearfishing on my own. We would go to FADS, which is a fa uh, fish, fish aggregation, aggregation device. device. Um, most of ours are between 20 and 90 miles um, off of our Atlantic coast here in Antigua. And I did not shoot anything of note for about a year. And wow. of course, it's different when you don't have anybody teaching you and all I was doing was just in a forum trying to figure out what gear, how to rig up and I figured out everything on my own which is why I enjoy teaching so much and I make a good spearfishing guide because I self-taught and also being self-taught is I'm not a product of everybody else's ideas so I actually innovated a lot of stuff myself um, I mean, I've never invented anything. It, it, it's it's funny though. There's this guy Chris Coates, who is somebody I immensely respect. Um, Legendary spearfisher out of South Africa. I've gotten to stay and meet him, and yeah, he's well known in the community. So there was a lot of stuff I thought I had invented or pioneered, and then Chris would throw up a video, and I'd be like, ah, man, that's the same thing I did, <laughs> right? Maybe slightly different, but you know, it's good to see that you know. Great minds think alike. <laughs> not only that, but you know, you're not inventing the wheel out here. You're, you're just not to. They, you know, because of social media, a lot more people are connected. But some of the best in the business, some of the best people who do what we do, you've never heard of them. You will never hear of them. Yeah. They're not on social media. So it, it's good and humbling to remember, you know, and it's something that you're always learning, especially with Wahoo. I call them the cats of the sea. I mean, those things, they have really a mind of their own. If you fish certain species, tuna, um, for instance, you know, it's it's a game of chum or flash, right? They they don't think, they don't, there's no stalk, there's no, you know, it's just, they go for that. You put something in the water that they focus on and then you position yourself what right by that thing that they're gonna go for and then you just shoot them. And, or, you know, you do it like the guys in Panama where you follow bait balls and then you just jump in the water and, you know, they just swim by you and you take your shot. But fish like Wahoo, it is a hunt. I mean, truly a hunt from beginning to end. You have to figure out where they are. Then you have to go and they're not usually going. I mean, you do get them dumb. Don't don't get me wrong, especially if you get them chum dumb. Well, and they're easiest fish in the world to shoot. But that brings in another aspect to it. It's one of the toughest fish to land because it's the softest flesh of all the pelagic species. So shot placement is everything. I mean, you know, and when you have a fish that's six feet long and, you know, this wide, and you think you can just shoot it and it'll be fine like you with most other species, tuna, you shoot it anywhere. The flesh is so thick. The hide is so thick mm. that pretty much anywhere you put a spare in it, you have a really, really good chance of landing it. You yeah, also have like a skin, like a, they're hard to even fillet to get the yeah. skin off because it's so thin. It's everything. I mean, and the flesh is so thin. So you, you have two real good avenues with shooting Wahoo, which is the front fins to the gill plate. Um, not my favorite, but a really good holding shot. And if you can make it, you know, you can go a little bit high and spine them. So they just roll over. Um, my favorite is the anal fins to the tail. All the bones are in there. There's no stomach cavity. And if you hit it there, wherever you hit it, it's gonna hurt the fish and affect its ability to run. 
Um, so, yeah. So you guys can see, George thinks like a fish. <laughs> it's just a fun species to hunt. And it really that's is. what I specialized in. And it's cool, so you're out there in the blue water, you just see just blue, All it's like you're floating in space. And then all of a sudden, this fish comes in, and man, the adrenaline, especially if you haven't seen them before, and, and the adrenaline just spikes. I, I've only shot one ever in South Africa, and the initial fight on those fish, the initial boom, you know, go, their fin moves so fast, it cavitates the water. It means there's so much friction between their tail and the water that actually boils little bits and actually makes bubbles, bubbles. Like, like a propeller on an engine. That's how fast these fish go. So they really, really are cool. So this gives you an idea that this man lives and breathes Wahoo. That, that is his fish, and he's known throughout the world for it. So it was, it was really cool to get to come here. And that, that's actually how George and I uh, first met, is I, I kind of knew about him, but I didn't really have a way to reach out. A mutual friend, thanks to Island Waterworld, uh, thank you very much, Patrick, for the introduction there, uh, made this happen here. And then speaking of other uh, introductions and such, I want to talk a little bit about Hannah and George. So. Hannah has been recently added on to the crew list here to help out with the charters. And Hannah, tell us a little bit about your background, how the two of you have met, and then I really want to take a couple minutes to talk about the mentorship that I've witnessed between you. Now, they never said mentorship. They never said mentor. I'm saying that because that's what I've watched their relationship be and the way that George has been teaching Hannah. But anyway, Hannah, go ahead with your background. Yeah, so um, a little bit of my personal background would be that I am Canadian. I'm from British Columbia, so the west coast of Canada. Um, as far as professional background, I did work on boats 14 years ago. Um, not to age myself too much, but I worked in Australia. <clears throat> Mostly like cooking and like a little bit of deckhand. Yeah. But very, like when I met George, I said... You're getting someone who is hardworking, open-minded, willing to learn, but he was like, do you know Port and Starward? And I even was like, yeah, because I was like, there's like a 50% chance I'm going to get that right. <laughs> so Port I, and left have four letters in it. That's all you got to remember. Port and left, four letters. But just like completely, you know, this was a new world to me. It was a new language. Yeah. And so lucky to have met someone as knowledgeable as George who this is his world this this is his language and he has patience and guidance and yeah I, I feel very yeah like no, it, it's been really cool watching them I mean yesterday we we went for a beautiful sunset sail mm -hmm. put the drone up got some great footage but then I also had to grab the camera to watch as Hannah was, you know, raising the mainsail with that, that beefy <laughs> automatic winch, you know, machine. And then as well, you know, uh, uh, George was teaching her, okay, like here's how to like ease off or bring in the jib sheet, but like be careful, you know, it's got tension. So you're learning about the wraps. Mm -hmm. And I also watched you when we were first up there, you were looking at the winch and you were spinning it before you put the line on and you were figuring out which way the line goes. That's because of George. Because George has told you it only yeah. goes one way. It always goes clockwise, it always goes clockwise on there. And so, so it's really cool. It's just, if you guys have watched my channel, you guys know that I'm a huge advocate for mentors anywhere you can. Right now with Spearfishing with George, I'm learning an absolute ton. But then as well, for sailing, there's no way I can do what I've done if it wasn't for my original mentor, Don Radcliffe, back in uh, Santa Cruz, California. And even now here, I've still got my friend Jay Safro, who's mentoring me on all sorts of things. Recently, I met a guy, Ron, sailed like half a million nautical miles, and I'll probably end up doing a Pacific Passage with him. So it's really cool getting to meet these people and learn, and I feel like it's the best way to learn. So anyway, just had to say that, that I'm so happy that you guys have that. But you're you're definitely getting a lot out of George, but George is getting a lot out of you too. <laughs> I, this is not I'm, a one-way street. Absolutely not a one-way street. Um, <laughs> One of the best human beings I've ever met, yeah. you know, which is first and foremost, which is why she gets all my patience. <laughs> <laughs> um, but incredible learner, hard worker, and it's going to be an absolute fantastic charter season with Hannah by my side. We've already done a few charters and it's just amazing. And it really is good whenever you have this sort of a split between the, the tasks on a charter boat. Because I, I have a lot of friends that do charters. Uh, I myself have never been on one, but I see how they operate. And effectively, you have the captain who's doing all the mechanical stuff, the navigation, anchoring the boat. Like, all the all the, the big boat stuff is being done here, so that's taken care of. Then you have Hannah, who's going to be preparing the meals. Uh, really, the guest services, making sure that everybody's comfortable, drinks, all the type of stuff. So between the two of them, 
you, you have everything taken care of. If it was either one of them, you know, it would be, if it was just George, you know, maybe it would be a little bit more bare boats. If it was just Hannah, you know, maybe the boat would end up on the beach permanently. <laughs> just a, you know, pro and a con, pro and a con. But anyway, so I always think that's cool to see. So George, tell us a little bit about what a normal charter would be like here. For those of us who have never been able to go on one, I'm, I'm curious to know, what, what does somebody get when they come here? What's a normal day like? So you're already winning just by being in Antigua. That is Over true. 365 beaches. Um, it is some of the most beautiful sailing and um, scenery on the water of any island. It's not hard being a charter captain and a charter boat here to impress anybody, to be honest, right? They, everything's doing a, a pretty good job for you. Um, one of the nice things about this boat, there are very few captains who know that a luxury boat like this, which is a keeled catamaran, um, you have catamarans with dagger boards, uh, but a lot of these... Um, cruising cats actually have fixed keels and I draw about four feet and because of my knowledge locally I'm not a captain that is from somewhere else that is chartering here locally I am from here and know the place intimately I actually beach this catamaran which is something oh that's cool don't ever see with a boat like this mm -hmm. you yeah, know in my boat on it beach. only does it accidentally my boat doesn't do it on purpose <laughs> um and because of that, and because of my local knowledge, a day charter, you design it, you tell me what you like, what your preferences are. Some people want to snorkel. That's their, 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 their focus um, on the charter. Some, they want to see as much of the island as possible. If you want, we'll sail around the island. Some want to sail more. Some want to spend more time on the beach. So basically, I because it's a private charter, it's a day charter I do, um, I will design the charter to your preference. You tell me what you want. I'll give you a few options. And then we pick what you want and we go do that. You know, um, whether it's guaranteeing you your own beach where you're the only footprints in the sand, we oh, do that. that's right. That is cool. That is you unique. Know? Um, there are very few places that can do that, you know, but because we have so many beaches, bays, uh, you can do that here, you know, and... Uh, we have some unique snorkeling here. We have, um, for instance, in Deep Bay, we have a shipwreck, uh, 1906. Uh, she's a natural shipwreck. She was a sailing cargo vessel. She was a British registered sailing bark. It's called the Andes. And she went down in 1906. Um, spectacular. It, it, she sits in 20 foot of water. Her bow, she's sitting upright, her bow, you can stand on the bow and be half out of the water. It's at three feet deep. It, I gotta it, take my dinghy over there. It's not far from here. Oh no, it is. Yeah. And it is something worth doing. It is absolutely spectacular. But now it's not just Antigua too. You also go over to Barbuda too, don't you? Yes, we do offer um, two day overnight charters to Barbuda, um, but it's not something that we do often. Uh, we specialize in the day sales around Antigua. Very cool. And so now while you're handling all that, could you tell us a little bit about what a normal day would be like for guests under your care? Yeah, so my priorities obviously are guest comfort. So welcoming them aboard, everyone gets a safety briefing and a little tiki mm. tour of the catamaran. Um, as George said, our charters are based on what the guest would like to do that day and what their priorities are, whether it's like lounging on the boat, watching the sunset, exploring some of the beaches. I am really at the disposal of George and the guests. So if they want another glass of sparkling wine or I'll bring them a towel when they come out of the water or just making sure that everything is mm. constantly organized if he needs a hand with anything. Um, my background is actually as a spa therapist, so guest services is something that I have been doing for over 10 years. Oh, cool. So, yeah. That sounds luxurious. That sounds very luxurious. I, I can't, I, it's hard to imagine something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah like... it is. Yeah. And something to throw in about Hannah that she didn't talk about. She is a world travel surfer. She lives on an island. Well, actually a peninsula, but part of an island group. Um, in Canada, we have the best, one of the best surfing 
well, the best surfing in Canada and some of the best surfing in the world. And so she is not new to the water or the marine environment. Uh, she's lived all over the world, New Zealand, Australia, um, you know, well traveled, well rounded. And yeah, it's a cool captain and crew they got going on here. Though I imagine you're probably happy to be here for the warmer water versus the colder uh, water of I love, Canada. I love Canada. I love Vancouver Island. I love where I live. But it, um, chilly? it's very cold. It's a little snowy for me. <laughs> cool. Well, cool. This just give you guys a sense, um, both of George's background, Hannah's background. Uh, and then also the big question is, if somebody wants to book you guys, what's the best way to book? So we have a Facebook page. We have Instagram. We have uh, our own web page, a landing site. And we'll just put the links up uh, below this video. Yeah, yeah I'll, put the, I'll put the links in the description. And they can just message come you through there. Come look for us. Just message us. And we'll sort out a charter to your needs. Awesome. Actually, I got, I got two quick questions. Do you guys go to English Harbor and do you guys go to Green Island? Wherever the guest wants within the time frame yeah. that we have, we're going. Okay. So if you guys are going to end up booking, um, and hopefully I'll have some episodes out by now from my time in English Harbor and Green Island, highly, highly recommend it. English Harbor will be, I would say a little more bougie. You know, you're going to have really nice beaches, really nice restaurants, mega yachts all around. So it's really cool for that. And if you don't want people, Green Island is especially, um, whatever the easternmost bay is. I highly recommend you guys go there. I spent 12 days on my boat alone in there and I loved it. And what's really great too is I'm sure you know that beach very well. And that beach must be perfect to beach the catamaran on because yeah. there's no swell into there. So if you guys get the chance, I highly recommend that. George, thank you so much. So nice meeting you, Dad. Hannah, thank you so much as well. Pleasure. And that's a scene. And that's a scene. And that's a wrap. And that's a wrap. We did it! Hey, thanks for making it all the way to the end of this video. This is probably gonna be the longest video I've ever made, but there's been a lot to talk about and show and share. So at this final part here, I just wanted to give you guys my two cents on the boat. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna start off by saying, I wish I owned a catamaran. They're great. They have a ton of space. They don't do this when you go sailing them. Uh, no, I, I love my boat Adventure Born, but there definitely is something to having a gigantic catamaran. There definitely is. Uh, now that being said, I've got a scoring that I do for boats. I have five different categories. Number one is its sailability, uh, how well the boat actually sails. Number two, its comfortability, how it is to live on the boat, uh, how nice it is to be an anchor every day is what I really care about. Number three is durability how strong the boat is in heavy seas, strong winds, how often things break, that's a big part of it. Number four is usability, how easy it is to use the boat itself, uh, are the lines, the rigging, mechanics, everything simple, can it be done by just one person, does it require a team? And then the fifth and last point is the price. How much does this boat cost to buy, maintain under normal use, repair when it does break, uh, marina haul out, and then another good way to look at this is out of 10 boat buyers, as in people that are definitely going to buy a boat, not shoppers, very big different. Out of 10 of those, how many of them will actually buy the boat? So let's dive right in. All right, number one, sailability. Now, I've seen George actually sail this boat because we were anchored next to each other for quite a ways. So I've actually seen him sail this boat around here and there, as well as being on the boat. Uh, landing my drone on this boat was... Probably not a true sense of its sailability, but certainly a true sense of its stability while out there and getting the sail on. We had seriously ideal conditions for our sail, so I don't feel like I really got to put this boat through its steps. That's fine. I don't need to do that. I can kind of tell you from what George said and from my own knowledge that this is a solid sailing boat. Um, considering the size of the mainsail, it's going to be super powered up uh, like it was in such light winds. But then also it was very stable, very comfortable. Uh, when we had, um, you know, low winds on the boat, even to the seas coming up and being a little bit rougher. All in all, uh, again, these numbers are really just arbitrary to my own personal opinion, but I would give this a 8 out of 10 for sailability. Just because, you know, unlike, say, like a true mono hull that's really going to have a better upwind advantage, I, I think that's a, a good point for it. I think that catamarans can do better going downwind because they're not going to dump out the wind from your head sail, so I kind of give catamarans a point back. This one being an older catamaran, really designed for comfort. It's not necessarily designed to be a great sailing boat. I don't know if I would rank my boat as an 8 out of a 10. I think I might even go lower on my boat for its sailability. Um, but I think that 8 out of 10 for this boat is a, uh, is a pretty solid number.
Number two is comfortability. Y you guys know this is gonna be the, the main high point for a non-performance catamaran. Uh, extremely easy to live aboard. All the cabins on the boat were very nice, very spacious, very luxurious. Uh, newer catamarans, because this one I believe was a 2003 uh, but newer catamarans do have a little bit more interior design in mind, so I can't give this one, you know, a full perfect score, but I would say that giving this boat a 9 out of 10 is a pretty uh, accurate assessment of it. It's just, yeah, you, you really feel like you're more in a house than anything else. The galley is all well laid out. Leopard makes a great boat. I would, I would, if I had to pick a production catamaran, I'd probably pick a Leopard. Um, so I would say for number two, I'm gonna give that a 9 out of 10. Number three, durability. Uh, this boat, I do know for a fact, has been neglected before George got it, and I know that he is putting in significant effort to repairing it. Obviously, the boat is more than fine the way it is, but George, uh, I think like anybody who spent the amount of time at sea that he has, he's a, definitely a bit of a perfectionist. Uh, I did see quite a few cracks on the boat. Um, I don't think that it's unseaworthy by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, certainly, every bit as seaworthy as my vessel. And uh, I do know, though, from talking to George, that it's expensive to repair the boat. So I know that's kind of becoming a bit of a thing. But as far as the durability itself, I'm going to have to give this one a uh, an 8 out of 10. I think it's going to do just fine out there. It's not meant to, you know, just go across the ocean immediately. And uh, could certainly, you know, being a little bit older, maybe would uh, have a little more damage after doing a major sale. But I think an 8 out of 10 is a pretty solid score for it. Number four, usability. Uh, very easy boat to use. I could pretty much figure out all the lines just by being on board for a few minutes there. And again, I have a monohull. This is a catamaran, so there's a few minor differences. The basic mechanics are all still the same. Uh, I seem to remember it being very, very easy to use. Like I said, um, you know, getting in and out of a marina might be like a little bit difficult, but you've got, um, I mean, you've got two motors you can kind of spin the boat on. Yes, it, it, everything seemed very straightforward to me. I don't feel like anything was very complicated on there. Uh, the rigging, anchoring, everything. And I watched them do it all and it seemed pretty seamless. So I'm gonna give this one an 8.5 out of 10. There is some things that could be maybe further back towards uh, the boat if you're gonna be taking it for a long distance cruising. And again, that's the lens I'm looking at this boat from. Not for racing, not even really for a charter. I don't really care about any of that. I really just care about living on the ocean. I think 8.5 out of uh, 10 for usability is a accurate score for it. All right, and the last category is price, where catamarans do the worst for the simple reason that they cost a lot of money to make them. They're worth a lot of money nowadays uh, because everybody wants them, and they cost a lot to maintain, repair, and marina, and haul out, and all that stuff. Uh, long story short, I give it a 5 out of 10. I first When I first got into sailing, there's no way I would have, would have said 5. I would have said 1 out of 10. Um, after doing the other boat tour with my friends on Monoceros, uh, that boat, uh, you know, we, we, I think I gave that one a 2 out of 10. Because the truth is, is, you look around at the anchorages and there's a lot of catamarans out nowadays. A lot of people with money are deciding to get into sailing and a lot less people that are budget, like myself, are out here on the water, I think. So I would say that probably half of boat owners that are buying boats right now would be able to and would buy this boat, would be able to maintain it, would be able to uh, keep it going. And you know, just for the sake of it, and I didn't talk at all uh, with George, the owner, about this, but I'm sure some of you are wondering what the, the boat like this would cost. If I had to just throw a number at this, and again, I'm not a boat broker, and I haven't been looking at boats because I'm actually very happy with mine, believe it or not, for everything I say. Uh, but I would say this boat would, his boat would probably be in the $250,000 range, um, depending on what the survey comes back with, depending on where you sell it, especially. You know, if you sell it, I don't know, you know, someplace really, really far away, uh, you know, an inconvenient location, it's not going to get as much versus if you go to Florida. If you go to Australia with it, you could make a whole lot more out of it. Um, but I think $250,000 probably fairly accurate. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it even goes for a little bit more just because you're talking about a four cabin boat, four stateroom boat. Uh, it just has so much usability, livability, sailability. It's an ideal boat. So all things told, sailability, comfortability, durability, usability, price, uh, the boat comes in at a 7.7 .7 out of 10. I think a lot of that comes down to its age and that it was misused before George, but George has put in a lot of investment into it and uh, it's certainly more than good enough for charter right now. I think that if you were living on the boat full time, like, like myself, you'd probably be like, ah, you know, maybe I don't need to do quite this much that George is doing, but because it's a charter boat, you got to put in that extra work, that extra effort, which George has certainly been doing.
All right, and a few more closing thoughts here. I first off want to say a major thank you to George and Hannah as well. Uh, George for letting me come and film on the boat and go for sail with them. But especially, uh, this is my little personal shout out and thank you to George for teaching me uh, his expertise in blue water spearfishing, especially around Wahoo. I told him directly that I really want to replicate his knowledge elsewhere. And I am very much looking forward to doing that as I come to sail in the Bahamas yet again uh, in a few more months here. So big shout out. Thank you to George for that. Second thing I want to say in these closing thoughts here is that I really wish I owned a catamaran. It's very nice. This space is really hard to beat and it is always a joy to be on one. Um, but you know what? I will say to other people out there who are boat shopping, you gotta love the boat that you can sail and you can go do and you can enjoy. If I had started on a boat like that, there's no way I could have afforded to maintain it. Uh, I really am on the best boat that I could be and I really advocate for those of you out there that are looking to buy a sailboat. Buy the best boat for you, not for your best dream of what you think a glamorous life will be because at the end of the day, George and I have the same view and we go to the same places and I'm into this for a tenth of what a boat like his would cost. So it's worth considering. Uh, next thing I want to tell you guys is that all the footage you saw shot today in this video is entirely mine, um, including like the drone shots of Antigua. And I really want to drive home that point that Antigua is a gorgeous country. Out of, I'm not a huge fan of a lot of the Southern Caribbean islands, if I'm being perfectly honest, but out of the Caribbean islands, uh, Antigua is a real favorite spot for me, especially for sailing and cruising. But yeah, it's, just, it's a wonderful place, which leads me into my next thought, which is if you guys are looking to charter a boat, this really could not be a better option. George's knowledge is going to be second to none. And now you have quite a bit of insight into the man. Uh, very few charter captains will have the experience that he does. And I didn't really get a chance, unfortunately, to pick his brain as much as I wanted to about his sailing career. Mostly I stuck to spearfishing and hearing his knowledge on that. So. If you want to hire George uh, for his charter on Blue, you can take a look at the link in the description below. I'm gonna have plenty of information there for you to reach out and contact him, his website, his Instagram, all that good stuff. Uh, the last thing I wanna let you guys know is if you have any comments uh, about what boat you'd like to see me do a tour of next, or if you think there's anything that I missed on this boat that you wanna see me hit in the next one, let me know in the comments. I read all my comments, so I like to know what you guys are thinking, what your guys' thoughts are, so feel free to message me what your thoughts are on that. And I think that's it. That'll wrap up this movie length long YouTube video. So I'll see you guys on the next adventure. Cheers. Thanks for joining me on this adventure. I hope you feel inspired to begin adventures of your own. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. For an exclusive in-depth look at this adventure lifestyle and to further support my channel, become a member of my Patreon crew. Link in the description. I'll see you on the next adventure.